Um, the first thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is what causes PTSD. Do you guys have any idea? Yeah. Trauma. Yeah, trauma, oh. absolutely. So in order for someone to develop PTSD, they have to be exposed to some sort of trauma. What I'm going to show you guys is the actual clinical definition of PTSD. I'm not going to do this to you throughout the whole entire presentation, just this one slide, all right? So this is sort of our medical definition of PTSD, and it's real long-winded, all right? Experienced or witnessed an event, events, that involved actual or threatened death, serious injury of self or others. And I did um, shorten this up a little bit so you don't pass out on me. But what I want to point out to you guys in this definition is that the person has to have either experience the trauma themselves or witness <coughs> it happening to someone else. So if someone develops PTSD, they do not necessarily have to have experienced the trauma firsthand. They can have um, seen it happen to someone else, all right? And it doesn't necessarily have to have been um, a trauma that would have been related to death, but it can also be a trauma where um, it was related to a very serious injury. But even that in and of itself is not going to be enough for someone to go on to develop PTSD, all right? There's a second criteria that must be met, and it has to do with that person's reaction to it, all right? Um, so there are some sickos in the world, and if someone saw, right? Yeah, there are. And so if someone saw something horrific happen and they enjoyed it, that's a totally different type of disorder. We're not talking about that one today. Okay? Um, so if someone saw something horrific happen or experienced something horrific happen, they had to have this specific reaction to it. All right? They had to have, have fear. They had to feel helpless. They had to be horrified by it. Something like this. Okay? So this is sort of the medical criteria. Now, there's some very specific uh, types of trauma that are the most common in our society. What do you suppose those are? War. Uh huh. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and the students that we have on our campus, this is going to be the most common type of trauma that our students have been exposed to. So some sort of combat exposure. Now, does that mean that every single veteran that we have on our campus has been exposed to combat trauma? No. no. And does that mean that every single student that has been um, deployed has been exposed to combat trauma? No. What we're seeing is roughly. Right now what the VA is guesstimating, and we're still getting numbers in, okay? But right now what the VA is estimating is roughly 18% of our vets uh, are coming back with some sort of PTSD. Also, if they've had any sort of previous exposure to any sort of trauma, then their risk of developing PTSD goes up, all right? Um, also, depending on what they did when they were over there, right? Were they flying the desk when they were over there? Uh, were they on the front lines when they were over there, et cetera? So it really depends on what happened. Um, but there's a lot of other types of trauma that people can get. Um, sexual assault is another very common thing that's going to cause people to develop PTSD. In fact, among women in our culture, sexual assault is the most common cause of PTSD, whereas for men, combat exposure is the most common cause of PTSD. Okay? There's two other very common causes of trauma. Natural disaster, people that survive, let's say, for example, Hurricane Katrina. All right? Uh, when I did my practicum in a state hospital, for example, I treated a lot of children that had um, developed PTSD um, through some of those natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina, for example. And then last but not least, anybody that survived a very serious accident, like a car accident. Um, if someone randomly survived a plane accident, that, you know, um, something like that, they can develop trauma from that. When someone has PTSD, there's certain types of symptomology that they're going to be experiencing. And these ones you're going to see pop up in your classes. So these, go, these are things you kind of want to pay attention to. Some of them are going to be more obvious in your classes than others. Okay, the first one is going to be re-experiencing. And this is where at certain unwanted times in the day or at night, they're going to be having their symptoms sort of come back up. For example, they can have unwanted intrusive thoughts. So something might remind them of the event, and then these thoughts will start popping up in their mind. It could be memories could be any sort of related feelings at all, okay? Um, they can also have nightmares, so they're trying to sleep <laughs> at night, and then the nightmares can wake them up. What will happen if someone's dealing with nightmares? I mean, what happens if you have really bad nightmares? You don't, you don't want to go to sleep. sleep. Yeah, you don't want to go to sleep, and if you are sleeping, then you're, um, you're not sleeping well. And so then a lot of people end up getting medication to help them sleep, and then there's this whole cycle that goes along with trying to over-medicate yourself so that you can sleep. Okay. Eventually, the, the sleep drugs sort of wear off, you develop a tolerance to them. Sometimes people will start self-medicating so that they can try to sleep. Uh, so that's when we get into some sort of substance use and abuse situations. People are trying to get some sleep. 
All right, so then sometimes people in your classes with PTSD can be you know, sleepier than other students because they're dealing with these symptoms of re-experiencing that aren't impacting their sleep cycle. Okay, another one is avoidance. The symptom of avoidance actually has an impact on treatment because it's very natural for people with PTSD to want to avoid things that are going to remind them of their trauma. Okay, and this is going to go a lot of different ways. It could be that they want to avoid the people that were related to the trauma. Uh, it could be they want to avoid the situations that remind them of trauma. Pictures, movies, uh, scenarios. If we have, let's say, a veteran that got uh, blown out of a Humvee, sometimes it can get so extreme that they don't want to drive when they come back. Right. It can also go get to where they avoid people. They avoid going out in public, okay? It really depends on how severe their situations are. In the classroom setting, the way avoidance might um, play out is gonna depend on your course content. So if you end up having certain discussions in class that might end up touching on some of the scenarios mm -hmm. that they found themselves in. I'll address that more in a little bit. The third symptom is numbing. What do you suppose numbing will be about? Just not thinking about anything. Yeah, just, just sort of in a way, not thinking about things, shutting down, not feeling it. Okay? So what happens when people develop PTSD, in a way it's like the body's attempt to try to help them deal with these really strong, powerful emotions, but they have difficulty feeling emotions. So they just might feel completely numb about the event. Sometimes they have a hard time even feeling positive emotions for the people in their lives. Okay, so they have trouble, even positive emotions they have trouble feeling. So they don't feel love, they don't feel joy. Okay? Uh, they have, uh, they ex experience something called anhedonia, which is the difficulty um, having fun doing anything. So the things that used to be fun for them is not anymore. So maybe they used to really like to go hunting and now they don't like to go hunting. Or maybe they used to really like to go out and go dancing and they don't like to go dancing anymore. Maybe they used to really like to read, that's not fun. Like nothing is fun or enjoyable anymore. They just don't feel any emotions, positive or negative. <laughs> okay, another part of numbing has to do with, uh, some of these people will feel what we call a sense of a foreshortened future. Sense of a foreshortened future. So they feel like it doesn't matter what I do with my life, I'm going to die much younger than everyone else anyway. Okay, so if you feel like that, that's going to lead to what? Risk, risk behavior. Risk taking behavior. A lot of risky behavior. Like what? Well, a lot of substance use and abuse. Okay, a lot of reckless driving, etc. Okay, um, and so that's going to lead into some of the other behaviors that we see these people engage in sometimes. Okay, and the fourth one, hyper arousal. This is going to have a major impact on how they behave in our classes. Okay, hyperarousal comes from the fact that these people were in or witnessed a, a situation where they could have died, but they could have been really hurt. And so what happens with hyperarousal is they're in a situation, they're in their environment, and they feel like they need to pay extra attention to everything that's going on because that will keep them alive. So if I always know what's going on in my environment, I can react to it before it gets dangerous. All right? And so what will happen then is they're very easily startled. Okay, so there could be a loud bang, and it's a human reaction to jump, right? But what happens if you have this hyperarousal symptom? You might just not, not just, you know, jump to it, but you might completely jump up out of your chair, for example. Okay, uh, they're going to be um, not only is it just easily startled, but they're going to have a tendency to want to pay extra attention to all of their surroundings. It's very common for people with PTSD to want to walk uh, next to walls. They want to have um, certain seats in locations to go to restaurants and want to make sure they sit where they can see the door, etc. Okay. I want to just give you guys some statistics now, just a little bit. I'm not going to overwhelm you to stats, but I just found a couple things that were interesting. All right. Not everyone that's exposed to trauma develops PTSD, which is really good because, okay, I found a statistic that shows the percentage of the population that's exposed to trauma, and so I broke it into gender for you guys. Okay. Um, if we look over here with men, so of 100% of, of the men in our population, what we see is 60% of men in our population are, are exposed to at least one traumatic event at some point in time in their lives, okay? And then 40% of men are never exposed to trauma. And then with women, it's 50-50, all right? So 50% of women are um, exposed to trauma at some point in their lives, and 
are never exposed. So, you know, half of all women are exposed to trauma, blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let me blank it. Yes? Okay. I was excited when I saw this. I thought that's really interesting. We would have a lot of trouble if all these people went on to develop PTSD, right? That's a whole lot of people, right? Uh, but what we see is that 8% of men go on to develop some sort of PTSD and 20% of women. Okay. That's interesting. 8% mm -hmm. of men. 8% uh -huh. of men and 20% of women. So men are exposed to slightly more trauma, but fewer men develop it. Men are, well, women are exposed to slightly less trauma, but more women develop it. So why? Well, I know why, because women will go seek help and men won't. That is one of the reasons. Uh -huh. Women are much more likely across the board to go in and seek treatment. Men are much more likely to self-medicate. We see that um, it's highly pronounced in depression, for example. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Okay. And another thing has to do with um, sort of the people that are more prone to develop PTSD in general, that they've done a lot of research on this, okay? So if you've been previously exposed to trauma, you're more likely to develop PTSD. Um, if you have a sense of powerlessness, you're more likely to develop PTSD. Well, across the board, if we look at genders, who's more likely to feel powerless in any situation? Women are more likely to feel powerless in our society, in any, pretty much any given society. And if you said that sexual assault is the number one mm -hmm. cause, it's almost never a one-time deal. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and so repeat exposure. One in four, one in four women, I think it's... One in three, yes, four. absolutely. Uh -huh. One-third of women is ever exposed to sexual assault. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so those are all really good points. And then the last little stat I want to pop up here to you guys, okay? If we combine all those numbers, what we see is that about seven, somewhere between seven and eight percent of the U.S. population will develop PTSD at some point in time in their lives. Like I said, there's all kinds of research going into the differences between the people that can be exposed to trauma and not develop it, the people that can be exposed to trauma and develop a traumatic reaction short term, something called acute stress disorder, and then it goes away. And then people that are exposed to trauma and then go on to develop full-blown PTSD because we have three different subsets of individuals. There's a lot of research going into that. I did a lit review, I did a small lit review. And I looked at some of the differences between the individuals that have PTSD that go to college and the people that have PTSD that don't go to college. So are there any differences? One of the things that comes up over and over and over and over and over again in literature is that people with PTSD have some difficulties that you think would make it harder for them to be in college. And those difficulties are problems with what? Attention, memory, learning. Great, right? That would be super hard to be in college and try to focus on these things, right? Yay. This, this to me, I got so excited when I found this. I'm also a dork, so I'm probably not excited, you guys. It's okay. But what we found, Okay, and there's a lot more studies in these. There's just two that I put up here. Okay, people in college do not show these difficulties. So people in college, with, and I'm talking about the PTSD population. Okay, so people in college that have been diagnosed with PTSD do not show difficulties with attention, memory, and learning. But they may have other problems. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So then the question is why? Why would they not have these? Okay, this is this is super cool. Okay, likely due to something we call their pre-morbid IQ. And what we mean by that is their actual IQ functioning before they were exposed to the trauma or before they got PTSD. Okay? There's a correlation between your IQ and whether you're likely to go to college or not. There's also a correlation between your IQ and how well you function after you've developed a disorder. Okay. So in essence, what the research is starting to lean towards is that the people who have PTSD who are functioning in college have a better grasp of dealing with their symptomology than the people who do not wind up in college. But there's but there's still a population of the college students who are, don't do, are not doing well. 
Absolutely. No, they're no, of course because they still have a disorder, but they're functioning better with their symptoms than those who drop out of college or those that are functioning so poorly that they cannot wind up in college at all. Does that make sense? Yeah, because they're probably not as antisocial or as depressed. And or as so um, lost in mm -hmm. substance abuse that they cannot get up in yeah. the morning, can't get themselves dressed. So the first five are best practices that came from a conglomeration of um, universities around the country. So these are best practices that I pulled from several of our um, sort of sister institutions, you know, universities, and their recommendations. The first one, uh, they recommend that you be very careful if you go to thank them for their service. We tend to want to be kind, and depending on your, your political views, of course, but a lot of people, we want to be kind to other human beings, and we want to be kind to our veterans, so we want to tell them thank you. They recommended that you be cautious uh, when thanking them for their service, because they said that many people have not yet quite finished processing their own contributions to what happened, and so they're not really sure how they feel about it yet. And so if they happen to be experiencing, you know, it's, it's a culture shock for them when they come back. And so if they're in the middle of that culture shock and they're in the middle of that processing experience, they might, that might make them feel weird, in essence, is what they said. So what should you say, or should you not say anything at all? I don't know, what do you guys think? Kind of depends on the student. If like they come it. up to you and they say, well, hey, I was a veteran, Obviously, they're telling you that for a reason, right? They want you to know that. And what would be an okay way to respond? I like it when people ask me how to respond. So like when I came back from Desert Storm, people would ask me how I felt about that. So that I could tell them. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Rather than starting off by assuming that it's a positive experience for them, oh. ask them how they feel about their service, if they, if they self-identify, and then you know how you can usually, your intuition's gonna tell you how to follow up. Yeah, that's typically what I tend What's it like now that you're back, or what's it like starting school again, or you know, not again, but what's it like being in school now? Anything like that, just kind of ask them a related question, but something. So, but I try to I try to stay away from something that sounds pat. Thank you for your service. Just sounds really like I'm not personalizing it for them. You know? And the reason, by the way, I wanted to backtrack for a second. The reason why I'm going ahead and I sort of started focusing this in on vets is because the vast majority of the research I found was on veterans with PTSD. So it's harder to find advice for classroom, just general classroom people for with PTSD. All everything I was finding was starting to narrow in on vets. So that's why this, the next two slides are focused on vets with PTSD. I want to point that out. Um, the second thing it said, um, I've got just course content down. What it was stating was that just be aware that certain course content is going to be prone to trigger um, certain feelings in them. This could be movies that we show, it could be writing assignments that you do for them, it could be speeches, okay? Um, because remember, they have that avoidance um, symptom. And so, um, it could be that they get up and walk out of the class because they're afraid they're gonna have a reaction, okay? It could be that they get and walk out because they're afraid they're gonna start crying. Um, it could be that they talk to you after class and say, I really, really cannot write a paper on this topic. Um, it could just be that they kind of shut down and, and you see them sitting in the back, they're spacing out. There's a lot of different reactions that they could have, but just maybe be aware of that. Um, and if it really looks like they're trying to avoid the topic, maybe you'll be a little bit sensitive to that. And just, you know, if you're willing to work around that, maybe be aware that that's, that is a, that's a real, very genuine response in them. But you can generally get a sense if someone's trying to pull your leg or not right. Just be aware. Okay. Um, oh, and one of my students told me, because I did, I did interview some students for this, uh, one of my students told me, he said, please tell them to uh, make sure that if you end up having to tweak any assignments or anything, that you talk to them about that privately. He said he's been in classes where um, professors have said, you know, okay, so we're all gonna do this assignment now, but don't worry, I've got something special for you. I know, right? <laughs> um, I said, surely, surely no one here would do that. And he said, yeah, they did. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I've got the questions up there. There's a big 
big no-no question that we don't ask vets? I really think of a no-no answer. <laughs> What's the no-no question? What do you think about the President of the United States? Oh, that's, that's a good no-no question. That's, a good <laughs> yeah. that's true. Well, I didn't even think about that. Is, that that's a good, I didn't even think about that as oh, yeah. oh, that yeah. is, like politics. Yeah. That's true. I do. <laughs> Are there war experiences? What's specific about their war experiences? What's Combat. Yeah. Did you kill anybody? Oh, my God. Yeah, or why they got discharged, or how they got hurt, or anything like that. Okay, um, people are very prone to ask veterans if they killed anybody while they were over there. And what it's like, okay? Uh, please do not ever ask a veteran that. And as the faculty member in a classroom, more, li more likely than us asking yeah. them, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear other students asking them that. And so um, if you're comfortable with it, please do intervene on I have had to do that a couple times. I do it nicely. Or even um, what job did you have? Oh, I was a sniper, one of mine told me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so if they self disclose, that's different. Yeah. But, you know, if your students are picking on each other, sometimes they have to be like little, you know, mothers to them or whatever. Um, veterans do tend to appreciate the fle any flexibility we can give them about VA appointments. Uh, some of you guys may know this in here, some of you may not, but it takes months. To get appointments with our lovely VA, <laughs> sometimes up to six months. Okay, and so if, if you have an assignment that's just absolutely set in stone, and therefore they have to miss their appointment, it can be months until they get it again. And so just anytime you can be flexible with that particular appointment, they really appreciate that. That's, that's a big deal to them, and that makes them feel more connected to the college. Last but not least, if you can be flexible with your classroom seating. I haven't heard a lot of students complain about this here necessarily, but just in case, um, pe most people with PTSD need to sit in a section of the room where they can see what's going on. Um, that helps them with that hyperarousal symptom. Okay, it's one of their self-management techniques. So they tend to like to sit in the back of the room where they can see what's going on. They can see everyone in the room. They can see the door, and that helps them feel like if something bad comes, I can respond to it quickly. Okay, and so. Um, most of them like to sit, like I said, in the back corner. And so, you know, assigned seating may, may not be beneficial if you have someone with PTSD in your classroom. So those are the best practices that came from, um, from some university studies. And then what I did is I interviewed some, uh, some of our own NLC veterans that have PTSD. And these are veterans that have come to me and self-disclosed that they have PTSD and just want to sit around and chat with me. And so I mentioned to them that I'm doing this presentation and there's some stuff that they wanted to tell you guys. So that's what I got on there too. Okay. Um, so real quick, like, okay, so this came up again and again. Um, they said don't single them out in class. And that could be just to ask them questions or just uh, specifically did they say. Yeah, it's just um, they may not be actually comfortable with talking. And they said their anxiety may not be showing because they've been trained to hide their anxiety. So sometimes we can feel like a student's comfortable talking with us, but they said that they may not look like they're anxious because they've been trained to hide it. They said they uh, work very, very well in a structured learning environment. Okay, so the more organized your syllabus is, uh, the more you follow uh, the course calendar, they said, some kind of visual learning, things like that. Uh, anything you can think of that would be more based on sort of the way the things would have been done in the military they respond to well. Okay. Okay. I thought this was very interesting because I thought, these don't go together, right? Mm -hmm. So I can tease them about that a little bit. Um, but then what they said is, because they're used to very short bursts of time constraints. So for example, that they would get a project, okay, you're being assigned this at 12 and it's due at 3. And so for us, we tend to give them more time than that. Okay, so, you know, okay, I'm telling you this project is going to be due in two weeks, so they have a tendency to procrastinate. That's just a, not just our PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more than the general. Yeah. Uh, they said they felt like they got less understanding from their faculty members because they were veterans. They felt like the faculty members on this expected them to do better. Oh. Really? Yeah. They, um, they said that they might feel anxious in a crowd. 
especially, I think, and that really what they were getting at here was that they, they feel very alone, they feel like they left their military family, mm -hmm. and the civilian, civilian world to them feels like a completely foreign entity, and that's what I was kind of getting at with the concept of a culture shock. So they really feel like no one can possibly understand them, and no one has been where they've been. Okay, and, and that's what they meant. Okay, um, that whole idea of hyper arousal just you know may make them feel distracted. So what, what might that look like in class? They look everywhere else except for you and paying attention. To yeah, so they might be looking at the places. Like they have ADD symptoms. Uh huh. Yeah. So they might not look like they have ADHD, like staring out the up. window or looking through things. Um, they said they relate better to faculty members that kind of uh, respect their life experiences. They do tend to have a lot more life under their belt than uh, the average student coming in of their same age. They have some really cool things that they've experienced and been through. Not, you know, not, not always cool things, but interesting things. And, and so they just said that they, they you know, they, they have a better uh, working relationship with those faculty members that, that respect that. Um, and this was very interesting. So I, I sort, I've tried to sort it to be you a know, positive report followed by sharing of similar experiences. They said they, they come you know, to college feeling like no one's going to understand me, no one has been through anything I've been through, and then as they get to know their fellow students and as they get to know us, they slowly start to realize that some of us have been through some things like that they've been through, and that really, really makes them start to feel connected to the college and feel connected to us. Okay. So, for example, once they find out that some faculty members here have served in the military, that starts to, you know, turn some light bulbs on. Um, one, of, one of these guys told me um, about one of the kinesiology faculty members that, that one of these guys got um, bone out of a humpy. He's got a very, very severe spinal cord injury, and he says he lives with a lot of anxiety that he is going to be permanently paralyzed if he does kind of the wrong exercises. But he really wants to keep his physical fitness, and so he's taking um, a kinesiology class. And he said that um, one of the faculty members there had shared something with the class that really made him feel very inspired because um, they, they kind of struggled with something too, some, some sort of physical ailment too. And he said that um, that made him realize like, what? This person has something going on physically too and look, and they're a, they're a college professor. It really made him feel very inspired to think that, does that make sense? That, that, those things don't just happen to people in the military, but it happens to other people too. And now, look, those people overcame it, and they're even teaching.